Living room logic. This is Spread the Good, a weekly mini series brought to you by Living Room Logic, where we talk about things like the progress to normalcy during the COVID 19 pandemic, how important it is to be compassionate, and answer questions from our socials at Living Room Logic. Come find us to join the conversation. Welcome to Spread the Good, right? This is Yay. coming out of a load of events which have popped up for me recently. And you know what? With everything going on, we're all so tired of all of this fear mongering and all of this stuff. So me and Aiden just came together and we're like, let's just talk about the good. Let's mm -hmm. just talk about the progress. Let's just talk about the hope and getting to normalcy and all of the good things happening. Because the reality of the situation is, is that we are so close we're so close to getting mm -hmm. there that me and Aiden just went yeah let's actually talk about that because when you look at twitter instagram tiktok anywhere you look it's just fear 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 so screw that let's talk about hope let's give each other compassion and let's talk about the plan because the reality is that the things that make us scared of covid are nearly gone we have mm -hmm. So many people, like the elderly, getting vaccinated, and we can already see that the death rate is going down, and that is fabulous, right? But let me tell you how this came to be. I got an email into my email account from a government agency in the Department of Health, which scared the bejesus out of me, and <laughs> I treated it. I treated it like I was getting an email from the Prince of Nigeria looking for money so he could escape. Because <laughs> no one re in reality expects to get an email from these people saying, hey, we want you. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about, Willis? Yeah. It was just such a ridiculous thing. Mm -hmm. But essentially, they, so they found me. And they, were, they found me and 11 other young scientists who were talking spreading the good word and they wanted to put us together on a team so i'm on this team now and i've met loads of members of nfet now like four or five now right mm -hmm. and what they wanted us to do for the first meeting was to talk to them about what needs to be changed about communicating stuff to young adults and i went there and i had meetings with like lecturers and teachers of things they heard i had meetings with loads of students and you know what they wanted to communicate and i had this big book of things to talk about and then I got there and I had nothing original to share because they actually did understand, right? They came into this meeting and like Ronan Glynn, who's the deputy chief medical officer, came into this meeting telling us what their research and what they thought was happening. And they came out and said that there is a second, second to the pandemic, there is a social and psychological crisis amongst young adults, which kind of had me going, ah, they do understand. Right, okay. <laughs> and they kind of came in saying that we need to acknowledge that there has been a sacrifice amongst young adults in particular. Like, these are the best years of your, their lives. And yeah. essentially, this freedom that you have in your 20s has been taken to some degree. Yeah. And not only this, as if there wasn't enough, like, hardship being this age, but now there's even less control and there's even less certainty. And with all of this together... It's totally understandable for people to be freaking out because you can't just say that people over 18 are these fully fledged strong ass adults who mm. have done all this stuff. Man, life beats you up. And like, yeah. like being a boxer for 200 matches, you learn how to take the punches. You learn how to cope with the stress. But when you're 18 to 25 to 30 in that bracket, you're learning how to get these coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And we don't have them. And there hasn't been any stress like it. No, and, and to be honest, like, you are right. Like, we are in the midst of this psychological crisis. It's really scary. And not many people are really talking about it, which is pretty much the whole point of this miniseries, is to get yeah. people thinking about this and, and, and start thinking about, well, yeah, I have been really anxious. Or, yeah, that has actually been affecting me a lot, but I've been putting it away, haven't been talking about it. And And as you said, like, we are social beings and we yearn for connection. So it's completely normal to feel these sort of scary things when you're told to stay in your house and within a five kilometer radius for six mm -hmm. months on end and wear a mask everywhere and everything is a bit scary. So there's actually like several different things that you might be feeling that are, you know, examples of this psychological crisis. Simple things, um, simple in, in a single word like anxiety, stress, 
excessively checking for symptoms. Like sometimes you might be, mm. oh, do I, someone coughed? You're like, <gasps> that's so true. You know, um, you can be like kind of irritable, you know, geez, I know I have been at times, you know, you can be insecure about are you doing things right? Are you wearing your mask at the right times? Are you doing, are you sticking to restrictions? Or, or, you know, so you could be unsure about some of these things. Or like really angry when you see someone not following restrictions and you're like, do you not realise my pain? Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, yeah, so and, these... and in different countries, the restrictions yeah. are different. And so it can be mm-hmm. really mentally draining to go on a social media and watch people in Australia having the time of their lives. Because I know that's how I feel. Oh, it's so annoying. <laughs> you know, it's so, so look, annoying. this is this is going on. And it's going on for everyone, every single person on the planet, young people, older people, but particularly young people who have no idea how to deal with it. So there are several things that you can do, okay? And they're going to sound a little bit basic, but please bear with me here. The first one, the most important thing is to connect, okay? You need to talk to other people about how you actually feel. In Ireland, we're so bad at talking Terrible. about our feelings and connecting so on a on a kind of properly deep emotional level mm-hmm. explaining how we feel right so whether it's a family member or a close friend or maybe not even a close friend you know take that leap of faith and be a little bit brave and go okay i'm going to tell someone who maybe i wouldn't about how i'm getting on you will be so surprised what they say they will tell you something mm-hmm. very similar or they will tell you something that's on their mind and there you go. For some reason, you feel better just by talking yeah. about it. OK, so you need to also be informed. This pandemic has been really depressing and people don't really want to constantly think about it and to be informed. But if you could maybe once a week or once every two weeks Go on to NFED and have a look at what is actually going on right now. And if you don't want to do that, I have a mini series podcast that I could advise you listen to that would cover the same thing. It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! What a perfect, uh, perfect bit of information. Just listen oh, to the podcast. So, so useful. <laughs> <laughs> You'd swear someone would think of that. Um, the the next bit is kind of to do with the the connection, but. You really do need to be honest. If someone asks you, how are you getting on? And if they actually say, how are you? Tell them. Tell them how you're feeling. You're feeling anxious. You're feeling a bit stressed. You, you can't do anything. You feel trapped. Whatever. Tell them. Actually be honest. Really important. Uh, one thing while we're in lockdown, which we're in right now, that will keep you a little bit more sane and that will help your mental health is a routine. Things like waking up and going to the bed at the same time. It sounds stupid simple, but it is so helpful. And also, everyone t- says it, everyone tells you, just exercise a bit. Go out for a walk. Honestly, throw the ball to your dog or play with your cat. Do whatever you can to just move around a bit. Mm-hmm. It, You know, there's so much science behind it, which we won't go into right now, but it works. And the last thing that I will say if none of that other stuff helps at all, is you need some form of entertainment and you need to literally make that time for I'm going to have fun from this hour to this yeah. hour. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to watch my favourite show on Netflix. I'm going to watch something on the TV. Um, I'm going to paint. I'm going to do something. Whatever it is that clears your mind, that's what you have to do. And you have to make the time. And actually, the last thing that I will say about that, maybe do something that you haven't done in a while or, or you know, something new, something maybe you might find a bit weird, something like if you've never tried meditation or if you've never tried painting a picture, uh, you know, do it. Uh, get an, an easel, a little cheap easel and try it out. Just try something new that might be a little bit fun. It could be very small. You know what my new thing that I did? What? I walked the other direction on my 5k walk and mm. I it was thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was a whole new but honestly it made a difference because I was like, well, this is actually a little bit different and it was the tiniest most silly amount of very like variety that I was actually like, huh. Because usually I start the walk and I'm like more alert and stuff. And by the end of the walk, I'm kind of like, oh, I'll get home and I'm not appreciating what's actually around me. So, yeah, honestly, it doesn't matter how small it is. Small amounts of variety are great. Maybe have a look at 
mindfulness. Uh, it's a very broad topic, but it's incredibly important to try and bring it into your day and meditation and things like that really help with that. So that really, you know, brings us to the actual elephant in the room, COVID. What is going on right now? Andrew, what the hell did you find out from your most recent <laughs> meeting with NFES? The end is nigh, <laughs> you know, like the end is in sight. And I think that needs to be done. Like we're kind of in this final stage, like Aiden was going through, we, where we, it's just the last sprint. It's the part where you're most exhausted and you have to run the hardest, right? And mm -hmm. it's just, we need so much compassion. So what I want to talk about is the progress, like the what is done, because this stuff only goes up. Like now we have about a million vaccines in Ireland done million people have gotten either their first or second dose. That's Amazing. unreal. Mm. And yeah, that's class. Uh, we've gotten stats coming out and it looks like by the end of June, four in five adults who want a vaccine in Ireland will have their first dose. That's by the end of June. And that is unreal. Wow. Yeah. And like, even with all this stuff coming out now and people are talking about like the AstraZeneca virus, uh, vaccine and they're like, oh, but what if they can't give it to people who are like under 30? That they they bought eighteen point five million vaccines, and when that came out, people were like, "What the hell is their plan?" Like people, <laughs> Why, people like... were like, "There's like five million people in Ireland. They at yeah. most need two doses. Why are they buying twice as many?" And the reality was, they were like, "Well, if something happens to a vaccine that one or two of them get pulled off the market for any reason, the vaccine rollout won't be affected." Mm -hmm. So even if the AstraZeneca vaccine can't be given to everyone. Ireland has ordered like 10 or to 15 or I don't know the exact number, but it's way more than the three we're doing. And as they get approved, we're ordering bundles of them. So it, we're, we're not dependent on the AstraZeneca vaccine to, you know, get out of this mess. So that's why. Yeah, so Which is good. very comforting to know. Oh, it's very comforting to know because like people are like, oh, I don't want the AstraZeneca vaccine. You probably won't get it is the mm. reality. Like mm -hmm. you, there's going to be so many more vaccines going out on the market. So it's great, <laughs> you know, so it's not actually a huge problem. After that, we have stuff like the, you know, we're getting the beginning of the end and we're getting the small things coming back. Like we have people going back to schools and we have like travel within the county opening up, being able to meet with people outdoors, like this whole thing of people, like the whole thing came out this week of like, oh, there's only a 0.1% chance of, you know, infection in outdoor settings. Fabulous. Meet people outdoors. Go for really walks cool. with people. Yeah, no, like that's great. And that's totally fine. Go for walks with your friends. The mm -hmm. thing is, is that you just can't go indoors afterwards. And like there's there's a whole culture of things of like, oh, yeah, sure. Come in for a cup of tea. Ah, you will. Ah, you will. And oh, that's we're, like, that's, we're so bad for it. We're terrible for it. Walk to spar together. Get a coffee. Then go, keep walking with your coffee or whatever. That's honestly yeah. the best thing we can do. And again, that goes back to the connecting. That's fabulous. You know, that's really important. Mm -hmm. And like over the next few weeks, like we're going to see like uh, in two weeks time on the 19th, we'll have like high performing athletes and gag getting back into training for intercounty. Mm -hmm. uh, 26th of April, they will have like outdoor sports facilities and underage uh, trainings will be coming back. And like in May, more than likely, we're going to see outdoor trainings coming back at some point, mm -hmm. you know, sometime between May and June as things progress, if things are going in the right direction. Next, I, I kind of want to talk about what how NFET sees this cooking, how they see this going. So they, they have these projections, right? And first off, the best thing I can say is that all of the projections, even in the worst scenario, they all show and the evidence coming out of everywhere is that as vaccinations go up, COVID goes down. That is like the perfect thing. So no matter what happens by mid-July, August, September, once all the, as vaccinations go out, even if the worst case scenario comes up, the amount of cases will start going down. Mm -hmm. That's just the nature of the vaccines. What we're trying to do in the meantime is because since we have this like dirty variant that has come out of gosh knows where, this mute, mutated COVID, mm -hmm. it's so much more infectious that it's so much more dangerous to open stuff up. And the yeah. thing is, is that if cases go up and hospitals get more busy, 
doctors and nurses have to get recalled from vaccination clinics, which will slow down the vaccine rollout and just mess everything up. Yeah. So we're kind we're kind of in that wiggle room point. So the way that they ha- they've shown it is that if we can get until the roughly the end of May, that by like late June, early July, we'll start seeing some return of normalcy. If we can keep things, you know, if we can keep people complying over the next eight weeks, if people mm-hmm. can look after each other and look after themselves until the end of May, that's the way it's looking, you know, because then we'll be getting into June. And by June, things will start to be relaxing you know, ideally if people are complying and people be able to look after each other a lot more. Mm-hmm. And it, it all boils down to this our value battle that's going on, right? Where we have this tug of war between how infectious COVID is, which obviously more things go up, and the vaccines going up, which pulls it down. And eventually the vaccines will win. It's just it, the vaccines will win a lot faster if we can comply just for these next eight to ten weeks. Like, and that's actually, it. I I think that it's really important to emphasize for the listeners that it's amazing. This is in our hands. We mm. will get rid of this pandemic, hopefully by October, if we do quite badly with sticking to the restrictions. But it's actually in our hands whether we want that to happen much earlier, June, July, August. Mm-hmm. If we just stick to the restrictions, it's amazing. We have, you know, when have we actually been able to see something like this? The, at this time last year, we were like this. We don't know when this is going to end. Now yeah. we actually know this is amazing. And to be honest, the only thing we need to do is socialize safely. Just just meet each other outside, you know, mm-hmm. go go to parks and stuff. Don't it's just household because that's that's the problem with this uh, variant is that. Mm-hmm the like infectiousness indoors is crazy higher than the original covid and that's why there's a problem yeah um anyway we want to also add to the very end of this thing to just answer quick questions from our instagram right so mm-hmm. every week we're going to ask put up a thing you can ask us questions and if we've already if i already know the answer from my meetings with enfet um, I'll answer them. And if I don't, I will literally ask members of NFET, right? So this week I met Laura Whelan, who's a policy ma- policymaker. I've met Ronan Glynn. I've met Deirdre Waters, la, 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 la. And every week I'll get to ask them more questions. So let's just quickly fly through three of them pretty briefly, right? The first one was, how much of the NFET advice does a government change? And the answer is a bit. Um, and it's because running a country is really complicated. Like, it's not just about... It's not just about the Department of Health and the health infrastructure and the risk of people, because in reality, we all want to come out of this pandemic into a country that has opportunity and has functionality. So we can't completely, they can't completely follow to the extremes that NFET want, because NFET's made up of doctors. So NFET are Hmm. going to put out the advice that is the literal, this is the maximum way to avoid the very worst of outcomes, which is anybody dying, and within reason of what the Department of Health can manage. So it's it's a balance. So they do have to change a bit. But honestly, the what the government has laid out isn't as far off from what NFET advises as you'd think. So the the next question is, will there be social bubbles? Um this is kind of something that might come in down the line, but not really. You see, the thing is, is that there's a lot of risk in a, even a household because all it takes is one person in the house to break the bubble of their household and go into someone else's house. And now you have two houses that might have an outbreak and then three, then one person in, again in either of those houses might go out and you're just creating this bubble of risk. So let's say if you had 10 people in a social bubble, mm. only one of them needs to break or make a mistake or go into someone's house, yeah. house briefly. And the risk is just so much higher. So at the moment, not really an opportunity. But down the line, as things kind of cool off a little bit, that's the reality. If you're going to do something, though, really emphasize that. Like, I am not condoning that you go make your own bubbles. That's not, it's not a good thing to do. But if you are, it needs to be so emphasized that if you have like six people meeting up you six people do not meet anyone else that's mm-hmm. it you have you have made your choice and you cannot break that and i and i think another actually quite positive thing to think about for these bubbles is that there actually will be 
vaccinated bubbles. So people who are vaccinated will mm. hopefully be able to meet with other vaccinated people. That's brand new. Who even thought of that? Like, it's it's incredible. So um, that is something to look forward to. As soon as you get your two doses of your vaccine or your full amount of doses, you will be able to, to meet yep. other vaccinated people. It's really cool. Um, so the last question uh, that we have here is, uh, would antigen testing speed up time until life reopens? In a world with unlimited resources, yes, that it would. In a world with, unre- un- with this infinite amount of doctors and nurses and money and all of that. But the reality is, is that Ireland, if Ireland started doing more rapid antigen testing. This would have to be done in hospitals, which would have to be done by nurses and doctors, and it would have to take up more space. And currently, that if we did that, that would lower the rate of vaccination. It would pull away from the health infrastructure. It would pull away from either non-COVID procedures that are going on. Because you have to remember, when COVID hit, no one was getting treated in hospitals. Anything unnecessary was put back, and the waiting lists are crazy. And they're only getting back to that now. So if they pulled doctors and nurses away to do more testing, it would slow the whole progress down. If we did more testing right now in Ireland, it might push it a month forward, you know, because we'd have less vaccinations. And that's the only thing that matters. Literally, the only thing that matters is compliance to lower that R value and vaccinations to lower that R value. And testing, the only benefit of testing is that you know you should quarantine and you know you should comply. But if you're complying anyway, it doesn't make a difference. Amazing. Great answer, man. Um, And thank you, NFET, <laughs> for informing yeah, me, Andrew. Yeah. Th- thank you for finding me, you scary government entities. <laughs> <laughs> so look, that pretty much finishes this episode. Uh, please, if you have any questions or if you, yeah, if you want us to answer anything else, please do. And have a look for us on our social media. Uh, living room logic okay thank you so much yeah and spread some good spread that good this is the end of the podcast we hope you enjoyed your time if you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned why don't you give us some of your money join our Patreon Join our Patreon Join our Patreon Join our Patreon